connect? Well, I think Montenegro never really thought of itself as being kind of the epicenter of World War Three. certainly not in the mind of the U.S. Commander-in-Chief. And there's some degree of, I think, people trying to laugh it off here, uh, but also a deep concern because the kind of the throes of Russia, its distant neighbor, and its desire to become part of the European Union and only join NATO last year really strike at the heart of this country's identity. At the moment, the coastline patches a bit owned by rich Russians, and it's in the middle of tourist season, so as far from aggression you could possibly imagine, the only sound I'm hearing is uh, crickets in the bushes. But Montenegro's government, trying to strike a delicate balance here, have released their first statement after some kind of uh, studied silence talking about their role of, for peace and stability in the region, about how at this point people value freedom and democracy most as enduring ideas, and more importantly, how they think there's sort of a, a permanent nature of, of solidity in their, in their relationship with the United States. So a country that's had a very difficult path into NATO, though. Uh, Russia, as I say, who have a great influence here, uh, sort of a Slavic country where the Orthodox Church is very powerful too, were very upset at their desire to join uh, NATO, and that occurred uh, back, in, um, back in June of last year, after a couple of bids, it seemed, by Russian intelligence that foment coups here. So Donald Trump's comments striking really at the heart of deep insecurities inside Montenegro. Back to you. Nick Payton Walsh in Montenegro. Lucky to have you there. Thanks so much, Nick. Some other news for you now. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg is facing backlash over a comment he made about Holocaust deniers in an interview that was published Wednesday. CNN senior media reporter Oliver Darcy is here now. Oliver, the fact that Mark Zuckerberg is having to clarify remarks he made about Holocaust deniers, that very sentence tells you the kind of trouble he's in. Yeah, Facebook's really having a hard time explaining how they're trying to fight misinformation on their platform. And this is the latest example in this like week-long PR crisis where Facebook's trying to explain why they don't remove offensive content while, um, while also trying to explain how they take fighting misinformation on the platform seriously. So Mark Zuckerberg goes on Kara Swisher's podcast, and she asks him um, a particular question about how are you allowing InfoWars, a website notorious for spreading conspiracy theories on online, how are you allowing that website to have a page on Facebook with nearly a million followers. And Zuckerberg gets into this thing where he says that he never wants to get into banning free speech. He doesn't want to ban speech outright. He'd rather restrict the distribution of that speech on Facebook. And um, he, he says that th the reason he doesn't want to ban speech is because he's not sure about the intent behind the speech. Mm -hmm. And to do this, he brings up the Holocaust. Now, let's listen to that audio. There's a set of people who uh, deny that the Holocaust happened, yes, right? So I find that deeply offensive. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I, I don't believe that our platform should take that down because I think that there are things that different people get wrong. Um, either, I, I don't think that they're intentionally getting it wrong, but I think that uh, they- In case of the Holocaust um, deniers, they might be, but go um, ahead. It's, it's hard to yeah. impugn intent um, mm -hmm. and to understand the intent. So Zuckerberg saying he, it's difficult to understand the intent of why someone might post something untrue on Facebook, even when it comes to Holocaust deniers. Um, that statement received a lot of controversy online, a lot of uproar. The Anti-Defamation League released a statement saying that Holocaust denying has been a willful uh, tactic used by anti-Semites for some time now. And there's so much controversy that Zuckerberg actually ended up releasing a statement in which he backtracked sort of on his comments. He said, I personally find Holocaust denial deeply offensive, and I absolutely did not, did not intend to defend the intent of people who deny that. Our goal of fake news is not to prevent anyone from saying something untrue, but to stop fake news and misinformation spreading across our services. If something is spreading and is rated false by false fact checkers, it would lose the vast majority of its distribution in newsfeed. Bottom line, are they going to remove the Holocaust denial stuff or not? They're, they're saying they're not going to remove content that's posted that is false. They rather restrict it. They rather downgrade it in newsfeed so people don't see it in newsfeed, but that that content is still available if someone wanted to go and, and search out that content themselves. Um, it's, it's causing a lot of controversy, and I think Facebook's going to need to really nail down their PR game if they're going to try to explain their, um, their tactic on fighting misinformation to a large audience, because this certainly is, is not... Not working. I'm not sure whether that answer is going to be satisfying. Oliver Darcy, great to have you here with us on New Day. Thanks so much. Thank you. Big turn now to something that will make us feel good instead of that. The good stuff. One passenger was making casual conversation with a fellow passenger and asked about the toughest part of her job as a teacher. Kimber Bermudez is that teacher, and she candidly told him about the financial struggles that many of her students face. 
The other passenger and others who overheard that conversation immediately pitched in, giving Kimber more than $500 to help her students. And joining us now is that teacher, Kimber Bermudez from Chicago's Carlos Fuentes Elementary. That's in Acero Charter School. Kimber, great to see you this morning. So tell us what it was that you said out loud that so inspired your fellow passengers who were listening. Well, <clears throat> sorry, I'm new to all this. I am definitely known as the talker, and I was just talking about my passion. I'm telling them I love my students. I'm so thankful that my school offers programs such as free hot breakfast always, free lunch, that we're willing to do anything because we're a community, and I guess people were listening. Huh. And why is it that so many of your students are financially struggling? Um, their parents really do their best and work the hardest that they can and will, will do anything for their child. But we do have a large population that are immigrants. We um, have students that came after Puerto Rico. We have um, after the natural disaster. We have students that have longtime families from Chicago. But it's just people that are working really hard and um, that just want the best for their child. And that's part of the reason they send them to our school. So not only was your seatmate really inspired and impressed by what you do and offered to help, he asked for your email and he said that he, his company might be able to make some donations, but then something else started happening and there was kind of this chain reaction. What did the man behind you who tapped you on the shoulder, what did he say and do? So he tapped me and I, I thought it was because he was worried about his baby kicking me or something and I had already told him not to worry about it. And he said, I apologize for listening and um, handed me a wad of cash and I had no idea how much money was there, but I saw a $100 bill on top. My parents had taught me, don't count money in front of people, that's rude. So I would find out later it's $500 and he started this chain reaction. The plane landed, the man across the aisle said, I don't have much, but I hope this helps. And then the man in front of me, and I'm just still beyond baffled. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And the man who gave you $500 said, quote, do something amazing. And so what are you going to do with your sudden windfall of cash? Well, I really want to get books for both Spanish and English for my class. And then I'm also hoping that this sparks something, some good in people, and that maybe my school could possibly get a playground or help with after-school funding. But for now, what I'm going to do is I want Spanish and English books so parents can be a community and read to their children in their native language. What did your school administrators say when you came back with cold, hard cash in your pocket? <laughs> I, I think uh, Mrs. Tanner was a little bit uh, shocked, and I kind of told her what happened, and we had no idea. But she told me, uh, I'm a talker. If this would happen to anyone, it wasn't, she wasn't surprised that it was me. And so what <laughs> does this so tell you, Kimber? I mean, what does this tell you? And we're living, obviously, in a time when there's lots of tension and animosity. And so what does your experience on this plane tell you about people? There are amazing people and that children are the future. And I think when people hear about children struggling or people that really want to make a better life, it, it warms their heart. And so I will never look at a stranger again. And this shows me there are kind people in this world. And even when things seem crazy, we truly do care about each other. Well, it's a beautiful message. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. And we hope that your kids can get that playground. And we're so happy that they're going to be able to get their books. Thanks so much, Kimber Bermudez, for sharing your story with Thank us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> what a wonderful, life-affirming moment. People are good. People are still good. You keep good. telling me that. I know. You keep telling me that. And you show me these I, things these to prove examples. it. I know. Show me Someday more. Show me will more. Melt. And it John will crack. Bowman. It will crack. Oh, that was so wonderful. Time now for CNN Newsroom and more wonderfulness with Poppy Harlow. Gotta love that. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Poppy Harlow in New York. I'm so glad you're with me this morning. And it is a busy one. The post-Helsinki clarification campaign at the White House continues. 
But clarity this morning? No, we don't really have that. To bring you up to speed, President Trump says in a new interview that he accepts that Russian agents did interfere in the election and that he would hold Vladimir Putin personally responsible. He further claims he gave the Russian president a very strong warning not to interfere again. But that can't be checked because well, no one was in the meeting except for translators. And that's now a problem for the Pentagon, which is scrambling to figure out this morning what, if anything, the president actually committed to on the military front. Because Russian officials now say there were, quote, verbal agreements between Putin and Trump, agreements that U.S. officials know nothing about. And that's a very big deal. The State Department, meanwhile, is flatly rejecting a proposal that the White House says it's considering, allowing Russians to interrogate American citizens whom Moscow loathes, among them a former U.S. ambassador to Russia. Even now, the president tells CBS News he doesn't know, quote, what all the fuss is about from his one-on-one -on -one summit with Vladimir Putin and the post-summit news conference. Meantime, this is the cover this morning of Time magazine. Summing it up in a single image, a merged image of Trump and Putin's face. This morning, the president still predicts that he and Putin will have a good relationship. And even in that network interview where he went further than ever before in blaming the Russian leader for hacking the election and attacking U.S. democracy, he wouldn't call him a liar. Listen.